presence is all about his goodness and his mercy. His presence is here tonight, and he is so good, and he wants to pour out his goodness on you. And I am so glad that you're here today. And so if this is your first time with us, my name's Joyce. My husband and I are the lead pastors here. We used to call senior pastors, but as I get older, I don't want to be called a senior. <laughs> so we're the lead pastors here. Uh-oh, I forgot my glasses. Um, let's see. Serena, would you run, get my glasses out of my handbag right there? Sorry, see, I really am a senior. <laughs> We're so glad that you're here. And so my husband and I have been, um, we started this church way back in 1990. We're still here doing what God's called us to do. We've been married 40 years. Thank you. We have four amazing children and four amazing spouses to our children. And we get the joy of working and serving with them and having all their children come over quite often they're at our house and so we have 13 grandchildren and so when we all get together it's so much fun and it's loud and it's messy and we have a blast and we just love it and it's just so so good and so we do a lot of fun things we have a lot of good family times and so one of the things we love to do is to dance and so my kitchen could have an island in it it would be nice but i've i've said no no island because we dance in the kitchen and we wouldn't have any dancing room and so we have a really uh, good good time together and as you've noticed the theme of tonight is goodness god is good he's so good to us and so we're going to continue with god's goodness and so if you you most people who know god would say god is good now often you hear people say god is good and someone will say all the time god is good god is always always good and so i'm opening up to the wrong page look at me okay i hope i have page one somewhere hold on just a second phew okay we're in business (laughs) all right so god is good and aw tozer wrote the goodness of god is infinitely more wonderful than we will ever be able to comprehend I mean, his goodness is beyond what our mere minds can comprehend. And see, God's goodness doesn't come from him doing good. He is good. He is goodness. He is inherently good. Goodness is his character. It's his essence. It's his nature. He is good. There's so many scriptures that that talk about him being good. Psalms 119.68 says, you are good and what you do is good. His creation was good. It was called good six times in Genesis. Psalms 31, how abundant is your goodness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. He is good to everyone. In Mark, Jesus agreed. He said, yes, God is good. And he went on to say, no one is good except God alone. Because as humans, we are not inherently good. We live in a fallen world. We possess a sinful nature. And we can have good traits and we can do good things and good deeds, but it's not our natural character. Have you ever met a toddler? <laughs> A toddler reveals human nature. So I'm going to read to you the toddler's rules of ownership. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you're playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. If it's broken, 
it's yours. <laughs> So in toddlers, in our adorable little toddlers, we see human nature on our own. We cannot be truly good, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can develop goodness in our life. And any goodness that we possess comes straight from the one who is good. So two things I want to impart to you tonight. One is that God wants you to experience his goodness. And God wants you to live out his goodness to others. In Psalms 34, David invites us to experience God's goodness. In verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, God is good. There is no evil or darkness in him. He is good. I like the thought here, taste and see. If you've traveled much into other countries, uh, you may have been offered some different looking food and you didn't know that it was gonna be good until you taste it. So for example, I was in uh, Italy and I ordered a pizza, right? In Italy, you order a pizza. It came with a fried egg on top of it. (laughs) I'm like, what? (laughs) But it was good. When I was in India, they brought out this huge fruit called a jackfruit. They can grow up to actually be about 100 pounds in size. And so they cut it open. They were really excited for me to try this. It didn't smell that great. But it, and actually, it looked all ooey and gooey, and it had little hard things in it to bite. And so it kind of reminded me of like an alien's brain cut open. <laughs> but it was really good, but I had to taste it to see. So taste, David's inviting us, taste and see that the Lord is good. To taste something is to experience it. So we have a little three-year-old grandson, Zion, and he was not allowed to eat sugar his first couple years, and then one day he tasted it. And he discovered, he experienced how good it is. And so now, you know, if we can't find him, he might be under a desk eating sugar. (laughs) So he loves sugar, he tasted it, now he craves it, and he has tasted sugar, and it was good. So David is telling us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Then the second part of that verse says, blessed is he who takes refuge in him. Blessed are those who run to him. Blessed means to be a privileged recipient of God's favor and to be fortunate and happy because of it. So blessed is the one who runs to God. I like the Amplified translation. It says, oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied, prosperous, and favored by God is the man who trusts and takes refuge in him. Favored, I like this other translation of the word favored, means spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of the outward conditions not dependent on what happens or circumstances. So blessed is he who takes refuge in him or who runs to God. It's like a child who runs to daddy's arms. There he is safe within his father's arms. And so you are blessed. I am blessed because of our relationship with God. We are a recipient of his favor. You're blessed as you run to Jesus. So it's a hard time you run to Jesus and God favors you. He causes you to prosper, to be filled with life, joy, and spite of the circumstances. God has bestowed his grace and favor upon you. You know, a sports team, they'll say, okay, this team is favored. God says, you are favored. He is on your side. So blessed is he who takes refuge in him. Then verses 9 and 10 in in, uh, Psalms 34 says, Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and weary, and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So both of these scriptures are saying that God will meet your needs, all your needs. You will lack nothing. You will lack no good thing. And this promises for those who fear the Lord and seek him. 
So the fear of the Lord is kind of hard to understand sometimes just because of the word fear. So I'm going to read the Amplified to you. It says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, revere and worship him. For there is no want in those who truly revere and worship him with godly fear. So fear of the Lord is to worship him, to have an awe and a reverence for him. It's, it's to have a heart after his heart. The fear of the Lord is equivalent to seeking God first with all of your heart. And we're told that if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto you. And so the fear of God is seeking him first Proverbs gives us more insight to the fear of God. It says the fear of God is to hate evil, Proverbs 8.13. If we truly call ourselves Christians, then we must not only love what God loves, but hate what God hates. Now, this doesn't give us license to be hateful to people, does it? Because it is the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It is the kindness and goodness of God that draws people to himself. I like the message translation of verse 9, Psalms 34, verse 9. It says, worship God if you want the best. Worship opens doors to all his goodness. Because what worship does it, it reveals an act. It reveals who we are and who God is. When we worship God, we're, we're humbling ourselves. We're bowing before him. We're looking at him, and it makes him bigger and our problems so much smaller because we're exalting him. We're magnifying him. A heart of worship is one who sees God in all of his strength and glory and a heart that trusts him. Then we read in verse 10 again in the message translation, it says, young lions on the prowl get hungry, but God seekers are full of God. God seekers are full of God. So if you are full of God, then you should be full of his goodness and operate in the fruit of the spirit, which goodness is one of the fruits of the spirit. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we get to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And so the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians, we know it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, is available to us. The fruit of the Spirit is an uprightness of heart. The goodness is an uprightness of heart and character living it out to others. It's a selfless desire to be generous to others with our words, with our attitudes. You know, to be like Jesus who went about doing good and bringing healing and comfort to uh, the world around him. Speaking words that were gracious and empowered people's lives. You know, gracious words are evidence of the power of the spirit in your life. Because love is never rude and ugly and puffed up, is it? And Jesus had gracious words. So everything that is good, everything that is good is found in God. We have wisdom. You know, without wisdom, people's lives are wrecked. Marriages are wrecked. Other it, people without wisdom can ruin other people's lives. And so 1 Corinthians 1.23 says that Christ, the wisdom of God, wisdom is found in Jesus. Faithfulness is found in Jesus. God will never leave you or abandon you. He's always with you. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it says he will never lead you. He will guide you, protect you. A peace, his peace that surpasses, uh, again, mere understanding. That's a good thing that when you're going through a storm, you can still have peace. His love, he loved you first. God loved you first. And his love never fails and it's unconditional. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. You don't have to earn it. Even when we don't deserve it, he loves us unconditionally, and his love is extravagant. His joy, again, his joy gives us strength. His kindness is compassion in action. It's love in action. His gentleness, all these good things are found in God's self-control. 
We need, girls, don't we need the fruit of the spirit of self-control. He can help us control our tongue. He can help us control our emotions. His strength, he gives us his strength, his forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a good and powerful thing that Jesus offers to us complete pardon. And you know, since we have been forgiven, we can only but forgive, only but forgive because unforgiveness will destroy our relationships. So all these good things are found in God. Every good thing is found in God. My Nana, which is my mom's mom, she's, well, my Nana was actually Nana number one and my mom was Nana number two and I'm Nana number three. But (laughs) that got a little complicated, so my mom is now blonde Nana and I am brown Nana. (laughs) And so, (laughs) my Nana and I used to write letters. Okay, that's how old I am. We had no cell phones. It was too expensive to call long distance. There was no such thing as texting and emailing and all that. So we wrote letters and I saved all of her letters. And she loved my husband. And so she would always sign every single letter, you and Tom be good to each other. You and Tom be good to each other. So young moms, actually moms of women of any age in any situation, but moms, I know life can be chaotic when your children are little or when you're raising teenagers. But I just want to encourage you today, be good to your husbands. You are an example to your children of what a healthy marriage and a healthy family is like. Be good to your husbands. Your words have the power of life and death. Speak words that build up, that encourage, that place honor, that show respect and love and appreciation. That grace that you've been given, give it to your family. Be good to your family. Now, nobody's perfect, right? And just in case you were thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, it is not. The grass is greener where you water it. So be good to your husband. So God's goodness, it's so amazing and so filled with his strength. God's goodness will protect you and guide you through life. And we know he has a good plan. So I'm gonna jump over to 1 Peter chapter two, verses one through three. I'm gonna start with verse three though. It says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, then go back to verse one. It says, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, grow in him, grow spiritually, grow. Let the Holy Spirit grow you and the fruits of the Spirit be manifested in your life. Have a hunger for the word of God and for his presence and time in prayer. And you know, if you've ever gone on a diet and you have to start eating salads, and you're like, oh my goodness, I'd rather have tortilla chips and salsa. Anybody with me? <laughs> but give you, I wanna give you a little secret. The more you eat those salads, you begin to crave those salads. So the more you spend in God's word and in his presence, you will begin to crave his word and his presence because it empowers you. It grows you spiritually and you become stronger in him and his goodness just begins to ooze out of you. And so in this world that is just so lost and broken and confused and angry, it needs to see God's goodness flowing out of you. And girls, you know you were created for this. You know you are God's design 
beautifully and wonderfully created for the good works that he has planned for you. Ephesians 2.10 tells you that. He made you uniquely you for all the goodness and all the good works that are to flow out of you. Paul told the Romans that, he said, I'm convinced that you are full of goodness. See, God has filled us with his goodness so that, Galatians 6.10 tells us, so that when opportunities present themselves, we should pass that goodness on to others. We're to be passing God's goodness on to others. So you might think, but what about that person? They're just really a thorn in my side. They're just really a pain in my butt. <laughs> They're just really, they just really tick me off. You know what I mean? Romans 12, 21 tells us, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by what? Doing good. And there was a time in my life when there was a person in my life and an extended family member that was very dif difficult. It was a hard time and I had to keep showing love, walking in love, showing God's goodness, showing long suffering, and it didn't happen overnight and it wasn't easy, but love and goodness broke through. Love never fails. You know, there's a, a story of a man um, who was at the McDonald's drive-through and he was taking too long to order, and so the woman behind him just laid on the horn, you know, long and loud, and so he decides he's gonna show her kindness, and when he gets up to the window, he pays for the car behind him. So the woman, so he pulls forward, and she pulls forward, and the lady says, oh, that car paid for you. So then she's like sheepishly and embarrassedly, she's like, thank you, you know, just uh, so embarrassed. So the, the guy gets up to the window to pick up his food, and he picks up, he gets his food, and he gets the food for the car behind us. And then he sped off as fast as he could. <laughs> So he almost conquered evil with good. <laughs> but Romans tells us, Romans 12, 9 says, love is, must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. So now we've been given an invitation by David to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now we get to invite others to taste and see how good God is. And so girls, we're to live out his goodness. We're to walk in his goodness. We're to rise up like Esther with courage and do what is good. We're to speak words of wisdom like Deborah. We're to be that virtuous woman who on her tongue has the law of kindness. We're to be good to our family like Ruth was to Naomi. Naomi and would not leave her. We're to be good like, and tell people about Jesus like the woman at the well did. The world needs to see God's goodness flowing from you. I want to read a story quickly from a book called um, Win the Day by Mark Patterson. Joseph Merrick was born in Leicester, England on, May, on August 5th, 1862. It's difficult to properly diagnose someone who predates modern medicine, but a few people, few people have suffered from more physical deformities. All 10 of his fingers were useless stubs. His misshapen head was the circumference of a man's waist. His distorted mouth made speech almost unintelligible. His right arm was twice the size of his left arm and his deformed legs could barely support his weight. In 19th century England, a perverse yet popular form of entertainment was human novelty exhibitions. Joseph Merrick was the headliner of one of these exhibits. Posters pronounced him half man and half elephant. People paid their shillings to see the human freak show, then shrieked in horror at the sight of him. One day, a surgeon named Frederick Trevis wandered into the human circus. His assessment of Joseph Merrick was similar to everyone else's. He was the most disgusting specimen of humanity that I have ever seen. 
But Dr. Trevis didn't shriek and didn't shrink away. Merrick's appearance piqued his scientific curiosity and no small measure of empathy. The good doctor tried talking to Merrick, but he wasn't able to decipher his speech. He did, however, hand him his business card. It was his business card that London police found on his person when they discovered Merrick huddled in a dark corner of a train station. Looking like a wounded animal, the police called Dr. Trevis, and Dr. Trevis took Merrick to the London hospital, where he would spend the remainder of his life. Shortly after Merrick's arrival, Dr. Trevis ordered a tray of food for him, but failed to warn the orderly who delivered it. When she saw him, she dropped her tray and ran out of the room screaming. Over time, however, the hospital staff came, became accustomed to his peculiar appearance. One day, in a carefully orchestrated experiment, Dr. Trevis arranged to have the, a woman enter Merrick's room, smile at him, and wish him good morning, and shake his hand. And Dr. Trevis recorded what he witnessed. He said, the effect upon poor Merrick was not quite what I had expected. As he let go of her hand, he bent his head on his knees and sobbed until I thought he would never cease. He told me afterwards that this was the first woman who had ever smiled at him and the first woman in his whole life who had shaken hands with him. That smile proved to be the tipping point, the turning point. He began to change little by little from a hunted thing into a man. Dr. Trevis listened to Merrick long enough and hard enough to finally decipher his garbled speech. He found Merrick to be both intelligent and articulate. A voracious reader of scripture, Merrick had a holy curiosity that encompassed all his life. Dr. Trevis smuggled him into boxes of London theaters to watch plays and to listen to operas. He gave him books to read. He took him to the countryside where Merrick loved listening to the songbirds and chasing rabbits and picking wildflowers. More than once, he remarked, I am happy every hour of the day. After Merrick's death at age 27, Dr. Trevis eulogized, <laughs> you know what I mean, the infamous <laughs> elephant man this way. His troubles had ennobled him, showed himself to be a gentle, affectionate, and lovable creature without a grievance and without an unkind word for anyone. I have never heard him complain. Never heard him complain. How is that even possible with the kind of trauma he experienced? Every hour of the day, happy? How does someone who was mistreated for so many years perhaps profess happiness every hour of the day? See, this man who lived in fear experienced goodness and kindness and that changed his life. And God wants to use you girls in everyday ways to show his goodness to others, making a difference in their lives. See, goodness is love in action. Goodness is perfected in God's giving and forgiving nature. It's through his mercy, his compassion and provision that God shows his goodness. And maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, my life is experiencing anything but God's goodness. Maybe your world seems to be crumbling around you and you're facing the most challenging situation. When life is hard or when you've experienced tremendous loss, God is still good. Remember Psalms 34 that we started out with when David's inviting us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Magnify his name with me. Exalt, let's exalt his name together. Did you know that David was running for his life when he wrote that Psalm? Saul was out to kill him. And so he went to the land of, of Gath or Goth or 
whatever you call that land. And he, he was still hiding for his life and some of the officials there recognized him. And so to save his life, he pretended like he was insane. So the king said, get him out of here. And so he had troubles and yet he's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because see, even in the difficult times, God is still good. He doesn't abandon us. We can run to him. He is our place of refuge. He is our strong tower. He is our place of safety. So when you face a difficult situation, you can trust that God is for you. He is on your side. You are favored. I've been through a few, uh, four very difficult seasons in my life and through every one of them god was good he's never failed me even when i didn't deserve it god has never failed me we're going to end with one of my favorite songs but it's all the phrase in it all my life he has been faithful god is still good even in the storm Henry Ford put it this way, he says, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind and not with it. So trust that in all things, God is working for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And girls, guess what? You're called, you're chosen, you're his girl. You're his daughter, and he's working everything together for good. His goodness cannot be stopped. Even if it was your own choice or your own um, decisions that caused trouble, guess what? God still loves you. He's still for you. He's still there for you. Even when you make mistakes, he's still there for you. He can turn your mistakes around for good. So girls, taste and see that the Lord is good. His plans for you are good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate are those who run to him and find refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's here to mend the broken hearts, to bring comfort to that one in distress. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is here to forgive and to make whole. The ultimate act of God's goodness is Jesus. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we, while we were still far away from him, Jesus died for us. He loves you girls, no matter what you're going through. He loves you. He's for you. Taste and see that he is good. So if you would just close your eyes for me just a moment. I just want to give opportunity to anyone here who has not yet tasted and seen that God is good. You can't say that if your life were to end tonight, that you would go to heaven to be with your heavenly father. You can't say that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and savior and committed your life to him. Yeah, you've heard about God. Maybe you even grew up in church, but you can't say, yes, I've tasted, I've seen God is good. God wants you to experience his goodness and his mercy. You can't earn it. And maybe you feel like you don't deserve it, but God loves you anyways. He loves you unconditionally, extravagantly. His love for you will never, ever stop. So tonight is your night. If you can't say that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, just raise your hand. I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but, but tonight is your night to taste of the goodness of God. Well, I'm just going to pray over you girls. If um, you were too afraid to raise your hand, but your heart's pounding in your chest and you want to come pray at the altar with us afterwards, we would love for you to do that. We would love for you to do that, that you would choose Jesus. 
He's already chosen you, but you need to choose him to be your Lord and your Savior. There's nothing better than serving God. Everything good is found in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these beautiful women created by your design with amazing plans and purposes. And Father, you created them to experience your goodness. Father, that no matter what they're going through, those who are experiencing hardship or difficulty, the hardest time in their life, maybe their heart is broken, Father, that you just shower them with your goodness, Lord. Overwhelm them with your love and your peace. Give those who are lacking wisdom, wisdom and abundant supply that comes straight from you, from your heart as they press into you and, and serve you and, and grow in you and in time in your word and your presence Lord minister your love your goodness Holy Spirit we commit our lives to you may we experience your goodness may we grow in your goodness father may we grow so that we can give out as opportunity arises your goodness to those around us father we thank you it's it's by your grace and your mercy Thank you for your goodness that you pour out on us, your girls, how we love you.